Thank you, one and all. My name is Greg Peterson, and I am the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center. That's my avocation. I'm a lawyer in Jamestown. That's my vocation. But boy, am I thrilled to be part of a really historic week here at of the Everett Jewish Life Center programming. I can't thank enough the courtesy, the kindness of the Everett Jewish Life Center and the hospitality they've extended to our guests, Gabriel and Ruth Bach, and to Cynthia and Eli Rosenbaum, and earlier this week to Herb Kaplow. It was just remarkable, and you've got to be so proud of the facility and so proud. And to uh, you know Jerry and Marsha and, and to Rick and Lynn Rochelle, just been terrific host and hostesses. Rick Spivak, Norm Weinberg, Len Katz, for making this extra special session. And I know this was Maybe. squeezing in something that was not originally on the schedule, but boy, the, the music that we just heard as I was listening out there was just incredible and remarkable. So, congratulations. <laughs> to make this possible, the Ever Jewish Life Center, like I said, has been, been a great supporter. Uh, Barbara Raitt, Fred Livingstone, there have been a couple of anonymous donors that have sort of made this the possibility of folks coming here uh, from Jerusalem and from Washington, and we've had a great week. And let me just briefly describe the week and why we're actually here today. This is the 60th anniversary of the completion of the Nuremberg Trials, plural. And why is that important? It's important because the Robert H. Jackson Center said we're only eight years old. We're down in Jamestown. We welcome one and all to come down there. But we're designed to enhance the legacy of Justice Robert H. Jackson. I will not go through his biography. I, I commend that you go over to the bookstore and pick up a book, uh, really for young readers, by Gail Gerald, give you a little overview of Jackson. But Robert H. Jackson, for our purposes, was the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial, singular. And that was the trial, the International Military Tribunal, which the defendants were Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, Ribbentrop, Keitel, Yodel, et al. Then after that, there were 12 subsequent trials against the actual perpetrators, the doctors, the judges, the Eitzengruppen, and tomorrow we'll learn about I.G. Farben. The interesting thing is that those 12 subsequent trials, they concluded in 1949, and hence 60 years ago. The composite of all of that legacy of the Nuremberg trial, now trials, is things that we've been learning about this week, and has run its gamut through the Eichmann trial. It's run the gamut through that which has occurred in the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt and for all the work the Office of Special Investigations has done through Eli Rosenbaum's uh, leadership. So we've been studying that this week. And for those who didn't get a chance to uh, listen to Gabriel Bach on Wednesday and Eli Rosenbaum today, you missed something. Uh, but we fortunately have a chance, and we're going to talk a little bit today. Program today. The program today is going to be one where um, it's, it's a good old, we're going to have a living room set here. And I'll be doing the moderating, and Gabriel Bach and Eli Rosenbaum will introduce a little more detail in a few minutes. We'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about their life and times. And if time permits, and it may not, and it may be impractical given the size of the group, but uh, we might try to get a Chautauqua-style Q&A. Um, in the meantime, we are... Uh, Passing around it for those who want some more information, perhaps, on what we've done this week uh, with Gabriel Bach and Eli Rosenbaum and other places. If you want to put down, and you don't have to, certainly, an email, uh, your email address, your, your address, uh, there'll be a pad floating around. Because I think we've had a lot of inquiries about whether or not the Jackson Center, since we filmed all this, we we're going to provide these and make these available in the form of DVDs of the various presentations. And the answer is probably. So uh, if you're interested, at least we can keep here focused on it. Now we're going to pause, we're going to stop, and we're going to try to get our arms around a life and times. And it's just a brief four-minute video piece 
where you're going to see a younger, just as handsome, Gabriel Bach. Sure, I can read this here. Sometimes the people on the list, this is a direct examination at preferred status, which meant they were protected from deportation. And when there was not enough human material, their special status was canceled. Did you know then that they were going to their deaths? That was Gabriel Bach asking. We didn't know that. They were going to their certain deaths. I can only say this. Early in 1943, I saw a type of official report addressed to the Jubra, thank you, to the Jewish Council. It said that that apparently there were fewer Jews in Poland than before. And we already knew that many Jews had been sent to Poland. Dr. Melkman, these people on the list, when did they leave? The next morning. They all had to assemble in the main road where the train was waiting. They had to get on, and in general, the train left at 11 o'clock in the morning. Gabriel Bach, who is here, is a treasure, first of all. I mean, we are privileged, blessed, beyond belief, to have Gabriel and his wife, Ruth, in our presence. <laughs> Let me tell you more. Gabriel Bach was, the quick biography in case you didn't see that, was educated at schools in Berlin, Amsterdam, and Jerusalem. He studied law at University College London, where he received his LLB honors degree. Thereafter, he studied at Lincoln's Inn, London, where he was called to the bar and became an English barrister. After completing his regular army service in Israel, he entered the state attorney general's office in state attorney's office in 1953 and was appointed state attorney of Israel in 1969. As we'll talk about here, he was the prosecutor in the case against Adolf Eichmann. In March 1982, he was appointed as a judge of the Israeli Supreme Court, a position he held until 1997. A few other points, and we'll hopefully we get into some of this. Anybody ever heard of Meyer Lansky? <laughs> Can I steal your thunder here for a second? Can I steal your thunder here for a second? Just to put, because we may not get to it, but know that at one point when he was attorney, attorney, state, state, attorney, attorney. Gen, state attorney, thank you, uh, he received an application from Meyer Lansky to become an Israeli citizen. And the man who had to deal with that application was one Gabriel Bach. I tell you what, we'll wait and let you tell the story later, but that's a teaser. That's a teaser. His wife, Ruth, and for those, uh, she's, she, and she's an incredibly, incredible class act. She's the daughter of Yehuda Arazi. And Yehuda Arazi, many of you may know, but he became popularized in the book by Leon Uris as Ari Ben Kanan. Wow. And Exodus, of course, and if you remember, Paul Newman, who played Ari Ben Khan, that was a uh, somewhat of a some, somewhat factual account of her father. So this is cool. Cool stuff. So Ruth, why don't you stand up so I can see you? Ruth. Eli Rosenbaum is the director of the United States Department of Justice Office of Special Investigation since 1995. He came to the department through honors program after his graduation from Harvard Law School in 1980. He was a trial attorney with the OSI from 1980 to 1984. In 1984, he went into the private sector for a while as a corporate litigator and then as general counsel also for the World Jewish Congress. He later returned to the OSI in 1988, where he was appointed as a principal deputy director. And as I mentioned, in 1995, he has been the director and responsible for a whole litany of cases. He went through them in great detail today. Uh, it was just mesmerizing and riveting. 
But we also know that Eli is nothing without his wife, Cynthia. And Cynthia, if you could just let them see what you look like, Cynthia. She's shy. So we're blessed. We've had them here as part of our program at the Robert Jackson Center with Chautauqua Institution as a partner in our special, special studies program. And so now I'd like to call up Gabriel up here. I'm going to kind of cock my seat a little bit, and we're just going to go through a little... Q&A. I was the, uh, since 1953, I was working in the state attorney's office, first as uh, assistant and then as deputy uh, state attorney. I handled very many uh, uh, cases of importance, espionage cases and others, and uh, attacks on an oil planes that have been abroad and all these things that I, I've done before. And about Eichmann himself, uh, I dealt with, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Kastner case. You know, Kastner was in Hungary during the war, and he was the Zionist representative uh, in, in, in Hungary, and uh, he had certain connections with I, Eichmann. You know, Eichmann usually sat in Berlin pulling the strings, but when the German army entered Hungary, Himmler, the head of the SS, ordered that the master himself, Eichmann, has to go to Hungary to see to it that no Jews should escape and you know, there should be no uprising or anything like that. So then a, a, a Kastner tried to save certain Jews. He also thought maybe the war would, grow, would, 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 would end somehow and then therefore he wanted to gain time. So that, that, that's a long story, but in any case he managed to get about one train out of uh, Hungary and he was then in Israel charged by someone that he was a traitor, that because that Eichmann arranged this with him, that he could save about a thousand Jews, and that in return he didn't warn sufficiently the other Jews in, in Hungary in order to enable them to, or, 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 or cause them to try to escape, and therefore hundreds of thousands were killed. And uh, that was regarded as, uh, this Kastner was, uh, uh, rather high official in the Israeli government, so uh, the state, the Attorney General then filed an action of libel against that person who had, uh, a, uh, had, had said that about Kastner, that he was a, a traitor and that he even joined in in the theft of the Jewish property. There was nothing in that, but in any case there was this libel case and uh, it ended for, the, for, for Kastner very badly. In fact, the, the, the judge of the district court in Jerusalem held that that was, that was not libel and that really Kastner behaved abominably by carrying out this, this, this kind of discussion and, uh, and negotiation with, uh, with Eichmann. So after that, I was not involved in the first instance, but then the Attorney General uh, asked me to prepare the appeal uh, against that judgment and there, it, by doing that uh, for a couple of months, uh, I learned quite a lot already about Eichmann and Eichmann's activity. Uh, the appeal was in fact uh, uh, successful and the court rescinded all these, these uh, accusations against Kastner except minor ones. Uh, but unfortunately Kastner was murdered uh, just a few months before the judgment of the Supreme Court. That was quite a tragedy. Uh, this was the first I knew about Eichmann, of course, not to the same extent that I knew afterwards, but that was my first connection with him. Then I didn't know that, he, that the, his whereabouts were known and all the, the, the uh, uh, planning of how he was uh, actually taken by force from Argentina by Israeli agents and brought to, uh, to Israel, that, all that I heard only later. My first information was when I, when I heard on the radio the message of our then Prime Minister Ben Gurion in the Knesset in our parliament when he said he had to make a special announcement and he said Adolf Eichmann is now in Israel and will be put on trial. I mean, I can't describe this, but the electrifying effect that had all over Israel and I was a, 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 a part of that. Two days later after Eichmann came to Israel, the uh, uh, Minister of Justice, Pinchas Rosen, uh, Rosenblut, as he was called before that, 
called me and he told me that the whole prison was vacated for Adolf Eichmann, not far from Haifa, the place near the place called Yagur, and there he was kept and all the uh, this whole all this was vacated and the the, the pop for, for, from the other prisoners and all the police officers in a, what's called Bureau 06, they were they were appointed in order to carry out the investigation against Eichmann, about 30 or 40 police officers, and when he asked me whether I was prepared to take upon myself the duty of legal advisor to the police bureau, which means, in fact, to be in charge of the investigation from a legal point of view. Uh, I was readily agreed to that, and uh, so for nine months I was actually living every day in next door to Eichmann in this prison where he was kept. I mean, I slept in a hotel in Haifa, but every morning I went into this uh, to this prison, and uh, a, uh, I was also the only connection Eichmann had with the outside world until his lawyers came. But I informed him and let him know that if he, until his lawyers came, if he uh, wanted to talk about some technical details like appointing his a defense counsel for himself or connection with his family, then he could come uh, could come to me. I let him know that I was not prepared to talk to him about the offenses which was, which he would be charged, or could be charged, or would be investigated. Uh, but uh, because then I would have to be a witness, and I knew that I would be one of the prosecutors at the trial. The minister also told me that it was clear that I would be one of the pro pro uh, prosecutors. Uh, so for, for nine months, I yesterday told about my first meeting with him, but that's, that's another, another matter. Hold uh, it, that's not another matter. This is maybe interested. Tell him what well, you... Well, I don't know, I don't know what I want to tell you. During that time, I, I, I never forget that, that day when I received the, uh, the, all the, inf the information that the police had. And on that day, I read the autobiography of a man called Rudolf Hess, not Hess, but Hess, O-E-S-S. Uh, he was the commander of the Auschwitz uh, death camp. And uh, he was caught and hanged by the Poles in 1948, 12 years before Eichmann was caught. And before he was executed, he wrote his biographical notes, his autobiography. And on that day, I just read how he described how they had many days on which they killed a thousand Jewish children a day. And he described how the children sometimes used to kneel down in order to be, not to be saved. And he wrote that when I had to push the children into the gas chambers, my knees were getting sometimes a bit wobbly. But then he added, but after that I always felt ashamed of this weakness of mine after I talked to Obersturmannführer Adolf Eichmann, because Eichmann explained to me that it's especially the children that have to be killed first. He says, because where is the logic that you kill a generation of older people and you leave alive a generation of possible avengers who might afterwards cause the rise of that race again? Now, that, that is, has to have some internal logic, is there? But ten minutes after I read that, they told me, Eichmann wants to see you. <laughs> and I, when I, I never forget that. Here he, he steps outside and coming in, and then he sat opposite me like, you had a little nearer than that, about a meter and a half. And, I, well, I, I think you won't be surprised to hear it was a bit difficult to keep a poker face when I just read that. I mean, that was my first meeting with him. Uh, as I say, for nine months we carried out the investigation. Then we filed the, uh, uh, the indictment. And there was also something uh, which the courts I realized only later. We, sent, we gave him the indictment in Hebrew, so he wrote, and I don't know how many of you know German, he said, uh, he said anyway, uh, with, uh, I, I, have, I, I sign it, but I have to, uh, to, to uh, uh, show and to, to stress that I'm not able, not capable of the Hebrew language, and he signed that too. Uh, and uh, so I, I took that and we had it tr translated, so I gave him a version in German of that. And uh, this piece of paper I kept with me, we never, never used it. 
I must say, what you know, now I think of the historic document here in his own handwriting, writing this. This is something which is, which is my home, and only later so I saw that this is really a document which <laughs> has, has its historic importance. All right, then I appeared on appeal together with the Attorney General, Edon Hausner, and the District Attorney of Tel Aviv, uh, Jakob Bauho, and uh, the three of us really handled the case in the sense that we examined the witnesses, we divided that up between us. I examined actually most of the witnesses who had some direct contact with Eichmann and who could tell about Eichmann's activities because, I mean, I had this intensive preparation through being just really coming to learn all the details during the, during this, the uh, police uh, investigation. By the way, when I said I didn't question him myself, there was a police officer who did and every evening I heard the, uh, the tape recording of Eichmann's uh, testimony and uh, before the, uh, the testimony before the police officer, his preliminary investigation, and then I prepared the questions that he should be, be asked next day by the police officer, so sort of indirectly, and uh, yeah, I had uh, control on that. And uh, knowing his character, that enabled me also, because I knew how he would react you know, through drafting the questions in this that way to obtain uh, additional evidence. And then uh, the, the trial itself took about three months, questioning the witnesses and the, uh, the final uh, uh, summing up. Then there was a judgment and then there was an appeal. I appeared also before the Supreme Court, together with the Attorney General. And uh, uh, so actually, and then afterwards, when the judgment was given on appeal, the whole thing took two years. So for two years, I spent practically full time with the uh, Eichmann affair. I can tell you, you know, but sometimes I'm asked, how, sort of, what sort of feeling do you, how could you stand all this, you know, every day? But you know, I, I mean, there were mixed feelings. Of course, there were traumatic uh, moments. There was, were days where man had sleepless nights and so on. But yet, you know, when all these years before that, you were all the time at the receiving end, that where you could do nothing about it, you heard about it, and you read about it, and there was nothing you could do. And then, to have the man who was really responsible for every aspect of carrying out this, this tremendous, this, this terrifying uh, act and crime, in the, in the international crime, that you could do that by, in the most democratic and progressive way, by proving this through one witness after another, that did give us uh, uh, really, uh, uh, can only describe it as some kind of satisfaction that one could do, do something to, to, to at least partial justice bring about. And I can tell you this, if we, I had carried out that investigation without any suspect person being present, <laughs> and then at the end of the investigation, they would have asked me, you can have one person to put on trial. You know, the really through him to show, to this trial, to show what happened to the Jewish people in Europe. There's no doubt that I would have chosen Eichmann as the person to put on trial, more than people of a possibly higher rank, because he was really responsible for every aspect of this terrifying uh, scheme. Uh, I, I mean, you, you know, we've, we found out that in the German uh, Ministry of, uh, of Security, the, in the Gestapo, you know, the, there were lots of, lots of departments, dozens of them, and everyone had a leader, and they were all the time, all of them, changed by rotation during the war. The only person who was not changed at all, all during the war, was head of the Jewish department, Adolf Eichmann, department 4B4, because his superiors, Himmler and Heydrich, Kaltenbrunner later, and Hitler, of course, they knew that he was absolutely, became absolutely obsessed with the, this, this task that he felt was on him to destroy this, this people. Uh, so, uh, uh, that is, I mean, I, in my career in the state attorney's office and afterwards as a judge, I mean, I never had routine cases. It was always sort of one adventure, one after another. It was not only the Maya Lansky affair, but lots of other things. But uh, still, when I look backwards, I think from the point of view of the importance of cases, this was this uh, sort of the central task that was uh, put on me. Eli, uh, 
similar question to you on the Damianic trial. How did that end up on your desk? And uh, was that already in the OSI when, when you were part of it? Was that percolating through? The uh, Damianic case has a, a, an interesting, uh, almost convoluted history, and in fact, um, its uh, origin in the uh, uh, U.S. Justice Department uh, precedes the creation of my office, the Office of Special Investigations, in 1979. Uh, Demyanyuk was first exposed um, as a result of um, uh, Soviet Union governmental action uh, around 1975-76, and by 1977 uh, he was being prosecuted by the U United States Attorney's Office in not so far away, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where he was living. Uh, it it uh, eventually uh, resulted in uh, his loss of citizenship as a result of that prosecution, which my office joined after we were created in 1979. Uh, I came to uh, OSI uh, that same year, uh, first as a summer intern, and then the following year in 1980 as a full-time uh, prosecutor uh, to work in an office that was uh, solely devoted uh, at that time uh, to the uh, identification, investigation, and prosecution of uh, people in the United States who took part in Nazi crimes of persecution. Uh, who could have imagined that there would be at least scores of such people living in this country? Uh, I grew up uh, learning about Nazis, you know, uh, in Europe and, and South America, uh, as I grew up uh, elsewhere in, in the Empire State in the 60s. Uh, when I got old enough to, to learn about the Holocaust, about the Shoah, and about efforts to, to bring its perpetrators to justice. I learned about the two great trials uh, that accomplished those goals. Uh, Nuremberg, led by Justice Jackson, uh, and then the Eichmann trial, led by Gideon Hausner and, and Gabriel Bach. Uh, I never had the, the great privilege to meet Mr. Justice Jackson. I think he died just before I was born. Uh, I have had the thrill of going to the center that's named in his honor, in nearby Jamestown, uh, and if you haven't been, shame on you. Uh, it's a short trip away, and you will be mesmerized. Uh, Greg and Adam and everybody, and Adam's dad, they've all done, uh, late father, have done an amazing job. Uh, and I've had the, the great honor of, of meeting Gabriel Bach. Uh, we've known each other for almost a decade now. I still get goosebumps when I hear him speak. Uh, and I've heard you speak a few times. Uh, I also had the, the privilege of, of meeting the late Gideon Hausner. Uh, but who could have imagined that those kinds of perpetrators were here, and yet they were, uh, Demyanyuk being one of them. Uh, if you had told me back in 1980 when I started my career at OSI as a federal prosecutor that in the year 2009 that Demyanyuk would still uh, be the subject of Justice Department litigation, and that we would finally, finally, on May 11, 2009, remove John Demyanyuk to Germany, uh, where he uh, stands accused of being an accessory in the murder of more than 29,000 Jewish men, women, children, and babies at the uh, Sobibor extermination camp, the Sobibor death camp in Nazi-occupied Poland, I would have said, that's, that's really not possible. Uh, indeed, if you would have told me that we would bring cases against scores of people from one cabinet-level official to members of mobile killing units to um, concentration camp SS personnel, uh, that I would get to interview, question these people, question two assistants, uh, two Adolf Eichmann, uh, that I would uh, interview a man in New York City of all places. The audacity of someone like this to live in New York City, Jacob Reimer, uh, who uh, finally confessed uh, under questioning uh, to me that he uh, led his men on a mission, as I talked about this morning, to liquidate, as he put it, a, a Jewish labor camp. I would have said, that's not possible. If you would have told me that I would be eventually running an office where I would get phone calls at least two weekends every month for a period of years, from uh, INS uh, border control agents at airports around the country telling me that we'd just stop one another individual you've put on your on our border control watch list that says he's a Nazi war criminal, can you help me question this guy? Uh, I would have said no, but 
but it all happened. Uh, I will never forget uh, a day in 1993 when we got the call from Kennedy Airport here in New York that they had stopped a man named Gunter Tabert. And we knew a lot about Gunter Tabert. He'd led a, a mixed force of German and Latvian personnel on a killing sweep uh, in an area of Latvia in 1941, murdering every Jewish man, woman, and child in sight. And we got to question this man, confirm his, his guilt. We confronted him with one of the grisliest documents I've ever seen, where he reports on killing uh, uh, a precise number that he offered more than a thousand uh, Jews in the town of Daugav Pils, and then uh, said that that wasn't enough. And he commanded a local official to make sure that the, the few Jews who were still being kept alive as slave laborers, that they should soon, in his words, no longer be required for work, so that he could complete the annihilation of, of the Jews of, of Daugav Pils. And there he was at Kennedy Airport in Queens, New York. I, I, I would have not believed any of that, uh, but, but it happened. And uh, I ended up uh, having this career of the summer law internship gone awry, as I said, um, getting to associate with uh, a remarkable team of prosecutors and historians. We have been until recently the only prosecutorial unit uh, in the United States with its own complement of historians. They do a lot of the investigative work, digging in archives around the world, finding the proverbial needle in a haystack like the Tabert document that I mentioned. And over and again, um, uh, they help us make these cases. We lawyers have to do the questioning, uh, but it's the historians who do much of the most important investigations and we're still, we're still at it, although our mission was expanded in December of 2004 when then-President Bush signed into law the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, which gave us responsibility for certain what we'll call modern-day war criminals, uh, people who took part in crimes in Rwanda, Guatemala, Bosnia, unfortunately a very long list. Uh, we are still very, very busy, believe it or not, at this late date, uh, in the World War II cases. Uh, in 2007, just over two years ago, for example, we won what we call at OSI our Guinness Book of World Records cases, case uh, against a man named Ivan Kaliman in, in Michigan. And we proved that he uh, committed murder of Jews in the city of Lvov, Ukraine, Lvov is sometimes Poland, um, in 1942, shooting Jews to death. And we proved it, as we often do, with a document that he himself wrote, that he signed, and that our historians found. We call it our Guinness Book of World Records case uh, because we proved in court that this man committed killings, perpetrated killings. I think it was, was it 40, I don't have the math uh, handy, for something like 46 years, 47 years, and five months earlier. Uh, and that um, is, is in the record books, if they kept record books for this, as the oldest killing ever proved in a court of law in any country at any time in the history of the world. And, and that's a, a tribute to the amazing people and the amazing work, uh, amazing people with whom I'm privileged to work and the incredible work that they do. For your life. In April, on April 2nd, 2009, Damianic is sort of a last ditch effort to avoid deportation. Actually, he filed a motion to reopen his deportation order on the grounds that deporting him would amount to torture <laughs> on the applicable international convention. When you read that argument, what was Eli Rosenbaum's response? My response was, gee, I've got lawyers on my staff who are writing the responsive brief but I'm going to write one sentence. <laughs> and I did, and I exercised my pride to make sure that it got into the brief, and that was basically to say that this is the height of audacity for a man who has been found by American courts to have been involved in the mass asphyxiation of Jews at the Silver Board death camp, and who also served at the Maidanic concentration camp and the Flossenburg concentration camp, for such a man to argue that in 2009, his removal 
to the Federal Republic of Germany, what we used to call West Germany, would violate the International Convention of Torture, was beyond out uh, outrageous. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the court agreed with us. Now, the interesting uh, situation in which we then found ourselves was that uh, even though Demjanjuk's deportation was carried out and he sits in a prison medical facility in uh, Munich, Germany right now and will go to trial probably this fall, uh, his appeal at the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati is still pending. <laughs> and it's odd because, the, as you say, uh, Greg, the appeal uh, claims that if removed to Germany, he will be tortured. Well, he's been in Germany since May. Uh, we haven't heard that he's been tortured. I haven't heard that he has dialed the German equivalent of 911 and said, help, come save me, they're torturing me. Uh, but, but we'll see. You, you, you didn't have your notes. You didn't know I was going to ask the question. But let me tell you what was said here in the brief. Uh, this is your words. Uh, but the claim is patently frivolous and, quote, incredible and unsupported surmise. This is a grotesque debasement of the word torture, a characterization that makes a mockery of the terrible suffering inflicted on genuine victims of torture at places like Sobibor Extermination Center. Ironically, Damianic has been confirmed by U.S. courts, including this court, to have contributed to the mass asphyxiation of thousands of civilians at a human extermination center as part of the largest scale tortures and murders in history. Uh, I, I, I write better than I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Somewhat along those same lines, uh, Gabriel, you had a chance, and we saw a brief example here, of direct examination of uh, individuals who had access to Eichmann. And you had a chance being in the prison with him and uh, to have that opportunity to, to, to get close to him. I've always been very curious uh, because all of us here residing and, and growing up in a kind of a Judeo-Christian mores of, of, uh, of a world and taught to respect your elders, taught to respect the law, the rule of law, have, have a variety of, of characterizations. And, and how, how one, we use Eichmann, but how a, a race could really ultimately support this, this vortex of evil that occurred. Do you have a sense of that from a person, from the personalities that you had a chance to, to talk with and examine, how that could occur? How he had it, how he felt. Three, or some of the people who were part of the German, the Nazis, and I know I use it to specifically yeah. Nazis. Well, well uh, during, the, uh, during the trial, no one on the part of the defense uh, tried to say that these actions were justified. I mean, the, you know, his defense counsel, Dr. Sabatio said, was actually during that day, that first day that he came to me, he wanted to consult me about the question of, of, of his law, possible lawyer. His, his family had chosen Dr. Sabatius. Dr. Sabatius was one of the uh, legal advisors to the accused people in the Nuremberg trial. He defended Zaukel, which was a minister of labor during the time of the Nazis, and the, the, the Nazi party. And his family wanted Sabatius. So Eichmann asked me, Tell me, first of all, would that be possible under Israeli law? So I said, yes, it would be possible, yes, because of the death penalty that possibly could, uh, he was, could be confronted with, and uh, uh, therefore he could have a German lawyer. Also, I said that he was an expert on Nazi affairs, and also um, he, I'm sure that his family made a thorough research when they, when they asked this, uh, that not only what it was justified, to, to choose him, but I want to also told him that the Israel government had decided to cover all the costs that were uh, connected with this kind of, uh, uh, with, this, with his, his defense. Uh, what I would like only to add, this person who was questioned here that you saw on television, he was actually the representative of the Jews of Holland. And uh, he, uh, as I told you, we had an argument also amongst our, these, the state attorneys I mean, well, many of us, many of, all of us wanted the trial not to take too long. So there was some, uh, at first, some intention by some, some of us to, uh, that, to really to uh, put the stress on the documents, on the written evidence, which was there, which could have 
shown that how many Jews were killed and that they would that the fact that they were killed, etc. But I personally insisted that from every country, there should, every country of Europe that we, we, we try to portray, that at least there would be one live witness who could tell the atmosphere, who could tell what happened to his family, what happened to his friends, and really to describe uh, what happened to, to the people concerned. Now this man, he was from Holland, and here I want to tell you a story, a story which might, might be of, of, of interest to you, and uh, was not covered by what, what I managed to say uh, in my lecture uh, yesterday. One of the things that we decided to do is to show a documentary film to the court. Uh, not too long. We decided about 45 minutes would be right to show the main uh, films that existed about Auschwitz and about uh, uh, Majdanek and about Belgian Belsen and all the corpses and so on. So I was asked by my colleagues that I should see all the documentary films that exist about the Holocaust and to pick about 45 minutes. So for three days and three nights, and to show you that also something is hard to forget, for three days and three nights I saw all the documentary films from Russia and from Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany and, and, and all the other countries uh, of, uh, of Europe. And I picked a, a, a film of about 45 minutes. Uh, as I said, the gas chambers of course in Auschwitz and the thousands of bodies in Berlin, Berlin etc. And amongst other things, I put in a short a documentary film about what happened in Holland. In Holland, Westerburg was a place where all the Jews who were sent to the east were collected and from there they were sent by train to the east to Auschwitz uh, to their death. But sort of when you see the film, you see their people were still quite nicely dressed. There were some children who had some toys in their hands and they were still smiling and they were put on this train and so so my, co my, my colleagues of the, the State Attorney's Office and the Attorney General, they said, look, uh, we have, this is a rather short film, and this is not so shocking. So why did you put in, we, we, have, we don't have so much, but why did you put in a few minutes of that? And I had the impression that they had a little bit of a suspicion that I did that because I lived in Holland. I mean, I, I, I tell you afterwards, I was born in Germany, but I lived for a year and half in Holland, they thought maybe that somehow influenced me. But I told them that, that that was not so. That I, you know, I felt that the ordinary person who sees the gas chambers and he sees the thousands of bodies lying there in Belgium, Belgium, this is something such an inferno that the ordinary person cannot identify himself with that. He cannot put himself in that place. But when he sees that, that here people were still quite nicely dressed and the children were still smiling. There the ordinary person would say, there but for the grace of God goes you. There the ordinary person can somehow uh, identify himself with that. Especially as we show what happened later on. We show what happened in Auschwitz. We show what happened in Berlin. -Bath. But that I thought was very, very uh, important. And uh, uh, my, my colleagues uh, agreed to that. and. Uh, uh, we put that part in and I thought that that was uh, uh, justified. Now, uh, this man, Mr. Meltman, he uh, described what happened to the, to, the, to the Dutch and he also described something which I said hard to forget. He said he was in this place uh, in, uh, in, in, in Holland uh, where all the Jews were, uh, were, were concentrated before they were sent away. And the leaders of the Jewish community, they had to help and to prepare anyways for the Nazis and the Nazis every week. It was always on a Tuesday morning that they, they informed every one of the thousand people who would be sent to, uh, to, to, the, to the east, to the death camps uh, on, on that day. And he described the feeling all during Monday night till Tuesday morning when they realized a thousand death sentences will be, will be decreased tomorrow morning. And how people felt, you know, when the names were, were pronounced. I mean, that is, amongst other things, one of the things that are very, 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 very difficult to, uh, uh, to forget. But about this film, that the documentary film, there's one other point.
boy which was typical for Eichmann. Before we showed this to the court, out of fairness to the accused, uh, we, we decided that we want to show him that film first without the judges being present, with his lawyers. So we, uh, the night before we showed that to the court, we had him, we, we brought him into the courtroom and together with his lawyers and we showed him that film. There were some journalists present as well. Now I knew the film, so I didn't look at the film, I looked at Eichmann. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how he would react when he saw these, these, these terrifying pictures. So he looked completely stoical, no, absolutely no, no reaction, and then suddenly he spoke in a very excited manner to the two wardens at his side. So when the whole thing was over, I called the warden. I said, tell me, why was he suddenly so excited? He said, yes, he said that he had been promised that he would never be taken to the courtroom unless he wears his dark blue suit. And here they take him out in his gray suit. And they shouldn't promise him something like that if they can't keep it. And he has to protest vehemently about that, that they're taking him in his gray suit and not his blue suit. That was the only thing that worried him when he saw the corpses in bearing bells. I mean, I mean, that says little, but it was so typical for, 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 that, for that person. You know, I, I very often ask what sort of a person was he. And I always, with any kind of accuse, I uh, refrain from defining someone as only, I mean, only a murderer, or only a robot, or only a, a bureaucrat, or only a Nazi. I mean, pe people are never only something. People are a combination and, and, and pass through certain stages of development. I think that was the same with him. Uh, he, at first, he thought it was good for his career to become an expert on Jewish matters. Then, when for the years you deal with the murder of innocent people day in, day out, I think either you must somehow go mad a little bit or, or convince yourself that you do something which in any way is justified. But he was not, uh, he was not dis diseased mentally. So, uh, with him it was this, I think, this, 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 this uh, sort of appearance. And then, towards the end of the war, he became absolutely identified physically and spiritually with, with this uh, uh, attempt to, uh, to annihilate the whole of the Jewish people uh, of Europe. And he told his friends, he said, he said towards the end of the war, I know the war is lost, but I'm still going to win my war. And then he went to Auschwitz to get the death rate increased from 10,000 a day to 12,000 a day. And when the German generals on the Eastern Front were clamoring for reinforcements, for ammunition, for additional power, he managed to get priority by with all kinds of trickery for his death trains. Mm -hmm. He must have known that he was really harming Germany's war effort about that. And uh, as I also mentioned, towards the end of the war, there was suddenly a, a request a, a proposal by someone which was vehemently supported by Eichmann that all German soldiers who were one quarter Jewish, one Jewish grandfather or one Jewish grandmother, that they should either be sterilized or sent to a, to a concentration camp. And Eichmann supported that very much. The, the commander-in-chief of the German army, Keitel, he uh, objected not out of humanitarian reasons, but because he thought it would weaken his army here towards the end of the war. There were thousands of soldiers who were in that condition and, then, and, then he, and, and were fighting together with the other comrades, so they, he thought that that would be demoralizing and weakening. So he opposed that, and Hitler supported Keitel in that. But for Eichmann, that, all these uh, uh, arguments were that, that, that was outside him. He was just interested to get to kill as many uh, as people possible. And uh, which was very, very, very typical for him. Uh, there was one, I mean, I, I also sometimes people, when they asked me, how did the judges, how did they react? I mean, the judges were very, very strict with us, with us, with the prosecution. They did not permit a, a single witness, a single piece of evidence to be brought before the court if that was not relevant. Uh, to the uh, to the Eichmann uh, to the to the to the Eichmann trial. It just said, I just want to, to portray this to you. Of course, I mean the, the whole uh, uh, courtroom there behind us was filled with people, representatives from all of, all over the world, and journalists and others. And of course, we wanted to bring to the attention of the world what happened there during the Holocaust. So, with some of the most important documents, when I 
put them in. I remember one very important document by the Nazi regime about the killing of Jews, the murder of Jews, and so on, and the persecution of Jews. I wanted to put this into court, so I gave it, I, I put it in. Uh, and uh, then I said, I want to read to you the main sections that are important. So, of course, I wanted everyone to hear the word, you know, what, what, what was in there. So, uh, the presiding judge said, uh, Mr. Bach, we'll read that. You don't have to read it out. We, we ourselves will read it. Uh, so, I got over that by saying, uh, look, I'm sure you're going to read that. But we want to now to stress which one of the sections are important to us. We want to read the whole document. We want to show you this and these, these sections and why it is important to explain this to you. So that I managed to get over that. I want to tell you that uh, one other point. When I told you that I, we, I insisted that there should be one live witness to every, from every country, from France, I decided to bring a professor, Professor Belair, he was a, a, a professor who was kept, was sent to the Drancy camp in France. There was a, a concentration camp for, mostly for Jews in, in, in Drancy. And that's where they brought the Jewish children. They had already, the parents were already, had already been deported to the east. And here the children were taken to this camp. Many of them from really well-to-do families and some of them nicely dressed, sometimes only with one shoe. And the, the parents, before they parted, they put the, the names around the neck of these children, but they sometimes playfully exchanged this amongst themselves. And the children were, of course, hungry and got ill gradually. So when this witness described all that, and then I asked, tell me, who is uh, Jacques Scher? So the judges, immediately the judge, the presiding judge interrupted. Has that got anything to do with Eichmann? So I said, uh, I, I please, you have to trust me give me the chance to show how connected everything is with Eichmann. So I said, yes, all right, but cut it short. So he described how this little boy, he was particularly aristocratic, and he was so nicely dressed, and he didn't, he didn't laugh, he didn't cry, he didn't take part in the place, so aside, but he looked very impressive. So he asked him, where are you from, what are your parents? So he said, my parents, my father was a famous lawyer, and my mother, a famous pianist in, Fr in, in France. And he came, saw that he's kept, kept, a, kept a, 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 his fist clenched all the time. So and he also slept in this room where this boy was. So then he had gave, the night after that, he had some courage and he said, tell me, why do you keep your fingers? Why do you have them? What have you got in your hand that you keep that your fingers clenched? So he opened the hand and um, there was half a biscuit. He said, I keep this for my mother when we meet. And then the boy starts to cry. I mean, he he kept going until that moment, but he did, he had no hope actually that he would see his parents alive. But he thought that as long as he kept this half biscuit, he kept his hope alive that one day they will meet again. So I said, "Tell me." So after this conversation, what happened? He said, "Next morning, after that, all the children." were taken into the trains and were sent to the east. And then I handed in a document by Eichmann, a telegram sent by Eichmann to his deputy working in the Drancy camp. And he said, Hoch erfreut, with great pleasure I can inform you that children transports from Drancy to Auschwitz can now move. So he, 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 he gave the direct order. And then later that witness also was brought to Auschwitz and he asked and he inquired and he saw that all the children he specifically inquired about uh, this little boy Jacques Stern that none of them was alive anymore. Uh, you know every year in the Israeli parliament they have a sort of meeting where they where everyone says talks about one particular person that he would like to remember. So I was also called there one some, some years ago and I, I spoke about Jacques Stern is someone that sort of uh, represents uh, what was happening there. Uh, I mean, it's just some of the few points I don't want to take up more of your time. Of course, uh, afterwards, if you want to know, I mean, of course, I also dealt with the W case in, in Israel, but that's, that's, that's another we question. We may get that in just Thank a you. second, but thank you, Bob.